All right, welcome uh, to the last session of the day for the first day of the Knowledge Graph Forum. Uh, hopefully you've been as intrigued and as interested by the sessions as I have. I'm Doug Kimball, the Chief Marketing Officer here at Onto Text, and very excited to talk to um, the interesting parts about LLMs. So let's go around the room and do a quick introduction. Uh, Alex, if you want to start off with your uh, who you are and what you do. Hi, um, I'm Alex. I'm C CEO and co-founder of Onlim. And what Onlim is doing, uh, uh, we have built a conversation, an enterprise conversational AI platform based on knowledge graphs. And in that sense, quite happy, of course, today with the panel, uh, discuss exactly of the combination of the two uh, uh, really exciting things, knowledge graphs and large language models. Awesome. And Lauren? Hi there. Yeah. So hi, everyone. And hi, Doug. It's really lovely to be here this evening or this afternoon, this morning, depends on where you're watching from. Um, so my name is Lauren Hawker Zaffer. I am a representative of Squirrel. Um, I work at Squirrel as the product office lead. Um, I also host the company podcast, which is Redefining AI. Um, a little bit about Squirrel. Um, so Squirrel is an augmented intelligence um, software provider. Um, we've been about for a couple of years now, our speciality lies with the implementation of Insight Engines, Enterprise Search, and most recently we've moved into Retrieval Augmented Generation with a combination of Enterprise <clears throat> Search and Large Language Models Generative AI Offerings. Sounds like a perfect uh, representation here. <laughs> and Basile, uh, we've met, but uh, tell me a bit about yourself. Okay, you, so you probably know me if you have all the Knowledge Graph Forum. Uh, I'm the CTO of OntoText. Uh, my role is I'm heading all the product development in OntoText, and I'm really deeply passionate about Knowledge Graphs. Actually, I'm doing this in the last uh, 15 years of my life, uh, trying to implement the Knowledge Graphs and really understand what are the customer needs and how really we can improve this technology. Awesome. Let's jump right in. So as, as the panel is with you, it's about what opportunities does LLM technology create for both data and business strategies? Uh, so we've got a good representation here. And for the audience in the background, we will be taking questions and in responding to those as we have time based on the, the, the conversation. So if there's anything particular that you want to ask us, make sure that you bring that up in the Q&A window. So Laura, let's start off with you. How How is Squirrel responding to the buzz around large language models. I mean, it's been a lot of noise out there since last year's Knowledge Graph Forum, and now so much has happened. So how are you guys uh, participating? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a good question to start off the session, and I would certainly say that um, we can clearly um, sort of undertone and mirror the sentiment that you've just emphasized there in the sense that there is a lot of buzz happening around the immersion of LLMs. And I think that the way that we would probably characterize how we're responding to it is um, quite positively. So I think that the embrace of large language models, it's really reshaped the technological landscape. And I think that it really has introduced sort of novel means of how we're working with information. Um, and I think that this new medium in itself has actually provided what, <coughs> us with an opportunity to play with our strengths. Um, so really work with the preconditions that I think are probably the most important when it comes to the use of LLMs in enterprise settings, especially. Um, and that's obviously, you know, precision, user trust, a solution that can really provide answers that are grounded in relevant and verifiable information. And I also think that it's really an opportunity as well as what we've seen for an organization to leverage a lot of their sort of institutional domain knowledge. And um, we've seen that with a lot of the augmented capabilities and opportunities that are presented not only by LLMs, but knowledge graphs, that it really is a sort of novel, as I've already mentioned, opportunity for organizations to operationalize a lot of their unique intellectual capital. Um, so I think that we're certainly on a similar journey. We're adapting to the market as it develops because it is ever developing. 
There's a lot of organizations that have tried out the technology themselves and now are understanding that there's only so far they can go with them um, LLMs. So they're coming to companies like us when they want to understand, you know, how can we enhance an LLM? How can we enhance it with information retrieval stacks? How can we work with vendors that really have this experience in, you know, data life cycles, the re regulatory landscapes, a lot of considerations around what is important when it comes to the use of LLMs, data privacy, sensitivity, um, things that we're certainly well versed in. So it's very exciting and I certainly think that we're working with, with more of a positive sentiment. It is exciting. It's also sometimes overwhelming, but I think it's, there's a lot of opportunities there. So with that same question now, actually, how are you, how are you guys responding to the opportunities around LLMs? Yeah, so as a platform provider that is in the middle of the space, so we are uh, providing a platform for conversational AI now uh, since eight years already. And what we did is always extending the platform. We started, of course, with uh, uh, when we have seen a good conversation, it's good knowledge. So we implemented the knowledge graph. And uh, what we have run now for a couple of years was actually uh, the classical nature language understanding intent based. So intent based means uh, uh, you create an intent, uh, you need a lot of training data, uh, and it was a lot of conversation going on. And we experimented, of course, also uh, quite a long time ago already uh, with the large language models. So we made um, a pilot project with Aleph Alpha, uh, the German company. Maybe some of uh, uh, the audience uh, will know uh, where we also did an integration uh, with large language models and knowledge graph is our platform. Uh, but three years ago, it was really where we said, OK, it's a nice technology, uh, but actually we couldn't see the benefit out of it. And then, of course, everybody knows one year ago, go, around uh, this uh, uh, time of the year, uh, the first breakthrough with uh, OpenAI uh, was coming along. And this was a little bit, uh, also we did a lot of experiments so far, was a little bit coming out of the nowhere. And at that point we have seen, okay, how should we react? So it was for us a little bit, uh, how should, how can we integrate it? And uh, the first point was of course, uh, uh, we did also a lot of uh, unstructured uh, data work uh, so that we uh, had to see how can we process unstructured data. Uh, we had customers that just gave us PDFs and we had to see how can we get out the, the links, linked entity out of this. And this was suddenly quite easy going uh, with the large language model. So we have seen uh, it's really great uh, technology uh, where we can solve uh, problems, but then also what we have um, recognized, and this was also then uh, this uh, coming up, uh, how can we use it actually in the conversational AI experience? And conversational AI experience, uh, I define not only uh, these uh, nice chatbots or dialogues, uh, but it's actually uh, that you get access in natural language to your data. And uh, that means because we are all uh, used uh, keyword based and uh, all the search or maybe uh, defining uh, complex queries. And this suddenly uh, also we were working already eight years. So it took us the onboarding process uh, uh, was actually quite extensive. And suddenly uh, we had a technology in our hands uh, that uh, you could uh, run on uh, your own data. You could uh, use it as a natural language understanding component. You could use it uh, to, to run uh, uh, good answers um, out of your own data. And this made it uh, quite powerful. And then was, of course, the next thing uh, technically uh, because it was not only as a platform provider you cannot say okay I take the API uh, like many agencies do so doing an experiment uh, with the open AI uh, API is, is uh, straightforward and you can do it uh, quite uh, fast but then uh, for us was the challenge how can we uh, provide a full integration in the platform uh, uh, so we did, of course, extended our architecture, uh, extended it with vector stores. Uh, then we had to see uh, actually, yeah, uh, how is this performing? And uh, this was the first step in our experience. And also we have, of course, a full fledged product now also since uh, two, three months uh, 
on the market out of it. But it's not stopping because also what we learned with the large language models is exactly that we say, okay, yeah, you have this hallucination. Also, some of the companies says, okay, uh, hallucination is disappearing and it's getting better, of course, with GPT-4. And um, uh, uh, but you never get rid of it, and this is exactly now our point that we actually uh, we moved uh, unstructured data there, so we get uh, an improvement in the user experience of the dialogues. Uh, but the second step is now that we are providing a, a full fledged combination uh, of these large language models and uh, uh, knowledge graphs, so that you uh, that we decide uh, when do we take unstructured documents or uh, when do we query the knowledge graph because we need exact facts uh, out of it. And in that sense, uh, uh, this was actually, it was, an, uh, I, I would say, from product point of view, one of the most exciting years in uh, in my professional career. Uh, but it was also uh, one of the most challenging uh, years because uh, it was also, uh, you have to see, so there uh, there is a lot of noise around it and nobody could see uh, what is the noise and where is really uh, uh, what is really uh, professional activities uh, going on? So how you separate the noise from uh, the yeah. different activities going on? So and this made it quite challenges, but uh, challenging. But uh, we did it now quite well. We are happy that we have now many of our customers. So we build an extension uh, of our product with the large language model, so it's seamless integrated. And uh, this was exactly that the, the product building uh, actually that we have here, and uh, we really have now good experience uh, with the with our customers in the different verticals how to use the combination. But we also know quite uh, uh, well what are challenges uh, we need to solve, and where we also will uh, cooperate here with OntoText, uh, of course, uh, uh, to move on here uh, with a deep integration of uh, these two really uh, fascinating technologies. And one of the things before I go to the seal, I want to come back to something that, that you said, Lauren. And it was the, it was the, the way you phrased it is instead of saying uh, gives us better opportunities to manage data, you said better opportunities to manage information, which I think is an interesting, it's a very important clarification because large language models are basically looking at just a massive amount of data, but we're using that to create information. Before Vasil, I come to your I bring a question to you. Can you expand just a bit on why you use the words information versus data, Lauren? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think it would probably be the actual end outcome of what we're trying to achieve and the use cases that we've seen um, in the sort of enthusiasm around using. We also have our, our own generative AI offering, um, which is Squirrel GPT, both for company data and web. And we see that the end product is really looking at the information retrieval. And the information retrieval has become such an important part of what we're offering because it's something that really helps us ground what the LLM's doing. I mean, as Alex has just mentioned, there's still a lot of hallucination happening. Um, it has gotten better, but it will certainly never be eradicated. So in that sense, we're really trying to ensure that the information that is provided to the end user is then enhanced and augmented as much as possible with the strengths that we have, obviously, in our um, sort of battle-tested information retrieval stack. Um, so it's really about the retrieval of information and the data as the component that's been ingested and indexed. Yeah. So that's why I use the words. Um, I, 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 it's, it's a good answer. And I think information, we're trying to get to wisdom and insights as a part of that. So Vasil, um, you, obviously, you're very deep into this. I love the passion that you have. What what challenges do you see that I guess the the the, the, or the world is facing data facing when it comes to dealing with LLMs, especially as it relates to obviously our passion and our experience of knowledge graphs? What 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 are some of the key challenges there? Absolutely. So uh, because I wanted also to comment on the first question regarding the LLMs and basically what is what was our impact actually we monitored this technology for quite some time because we were in the text analytics business and this type of transformers and models like bird uh, for name entity recognition uh, but out of a sudden yes uh, as the other panelists say the chat gpt was available and they basically used the same technology to train a large language model which was fine-tuned and it's at some point they launched a service which say it can do everything for you. Basically, you go with any type of a task and basically you have the answer. 
Uh, and to be very honest, at some point we were even asking ourselves, okay, is there any magical tool which comes out of nowhere somehow, uh, which will make the knowledge graphs obsolete? Ob obviously, after some critical testing and exploration, you basically start to understand the flaws and basically that this technology is not perfect and it's making all these type of hallucinations. Uh, but in the beginning, it was not that obvious, at least to me, that uh, there is no really major breakthrough. Actually, still, I would consider there is a major breakthrough in this technology, but it, it's in a different area. And yes, I, actually, from a database and knowledge graph perspective, I believe this is a really a technology which uh, can complement the knowledge graphs at all, uh, of course. Uh, uh, but on the other hand, I would say that it negatively impacted our part of the text analytics business, or at least we should we have fo refocus some of the text analytical business. So type of task like name entity recognition, I don't think they're any longer interested. And I hope that none of these companies who are around with this text analytics business can really expect that they'll sustain it. And actually we had to refocus some of our internal research activities more on the entity linkings and things which we know that the these type of LOMs are very weak because they are never trained to recognize entities from databases. Uh, so to, just to go back to your, I think, original question, uh, what is really the impact and the challenges we are facing relating the knowledge graphs? Um, obviously, the, the big change and the first question was from our clients. And basically, they were coming to us and saying, OK, knowledge graphs are expensive and you know there there is a ton of research how expensive it's actually to build one high quality knowledge graph and to develop it and one of the first questions actually after really initial idea and assessment of the technology was uh can you use the generative ai to over this cost please because we won't really invest more in knowledge graphs but we want to make it at a much lower cost uh, and actually, it's obviously it's not a new technology, as I say. It, it's really this type of transformers were available uh, in in many ways. But the real challenges uh, I will speak from a knowledge graph perspective is really uh, how you how you can build a knowledge graph which can trust. And I will relate also to our text analytical business, where in the it's a classical it's a similar to the information extraction challenge. You have a document and you have to populate some structured information. In the information, classical information extraction, it's even an easier task because you don't have to guess the schema. The schema is given. And in our experience, we have found that if you go a little bit, then let's call this F score or accuracy, whatever you metric around 80 or 85%, uh, it's slower actually the information extraction to, su to suggest something and then to humor to curate it. And actually, you need really high precision in order to really the people to start trust this type of information. And it, obviously, I would say this is still a research task, how you can generate knowledge graphs from LLMs. Uh, and there is still not a hard proof that generating knowledge graphs from LLM will can really speed up this type this process. But still, I'm sure that many of us, I, I will not hide this for on to text, but many of us, and partners and competitors are currently trying to do this and are investing in R&D resources to automate this type of a task. So this is exactly one of the opportunities uh, we saw how to lower this barrier. And the other opportunity is obviously it's going to the LLM market and say, OK, our knowledge graphs and real knowledge uh, can really reduce the hallucinations and you can control the LLMs by providing the grounding you know, context. Uh, what Warren said, this is really search uh, search augmented retrieval of data and generation by providing grounding context to be able to constrain the LOMs in generation. So in general, I believe there will be a positive impact, although some things like the text analytical business get also negative. So it's really a disruption. There's a lot there's a lot there that it's I think it leads well into the next question when I bring up over to to Alex really is you know, one of the couple of things I heard Vasil talk about was was trust in the data and then the cost of the, how we make this whole process uh, easier if we're looking at knowledge graphs. But as you look at the clients that you're talking to, the one implement large language models into their existing data infrastructures, what are some of the challenges you're seeing on the on the client implementation side besides trust and besides, I guess, cost? 
I think there is one, of course, we are in Europe, so it's the GDPR issue mm -hmm. is, of course, always a topic. So in that sense, I have uh, never seen, so we are uh, GDPR compliant and provide everything. And then uh, you see suddenly uh, banks uh, just taking uh, open AI APIs, <laughs> experimenting and say, okay, it doesn't happen anymore. But this is, of course, definitely uh, a topic. But what we see is, of course, also when you work with customers, um, it's a little bit um, uh, getting the expectations, what you can do with the LLM and uh, what you can, uh, uh, what kind of, uh, of data they need to provide and how you work with it. I think this was quite most, um, uh, uh, was a good experience also for us because of course also uh, we had to learn for it because it's not, uh, of course you can, uh, when you run a good conversation on any unstructured data, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's good, you can take the data, but at the end of the day also it's not straightforward because you need to see, uh, you get better results if you maybe uh, extract metadata uh, uh, also out of unstructured document. Uh, you need to see what is overlapping uh, content and and that also shows uh, uh, simple use cases are really straightforward. You get it up in a couple of seconds, minutes, uh, uh, but if you really uh, are digging into quite large uh, data sets, uh, it's uh, something where you also uh, need to see what is a kind of good uh, uh, data uh, structure, architecture, how you manage the different types of data, how you manage uh, the use cases. So it's of course speeding up everything, but it's not the way that you say, okay, everything in one bot and the large language model uh, provides the result. And this is uh, definitely something, this is good for us because it's actually our business. Uh, and uh, this will also stay a little bit uh, in future. So what we could actually do, what I said already in the beginning, was we could speed up every process. And also, it, as Vasil just explained, uh, this text extraction um, and text analytics part. Uh, really, we writing rules and grammars and all the stuff. So this is more or less uh, gone. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, the experience is, of course, here. Uh, that you are, uh, uh, you, and this is also the learning on our side with the customer. So we have web crawling infrastructure, but of course, uh, then the customers give us our website, but on each website, normally there is web con uh, marketing content. Marketing content, as we also discussed already, has uh, is nice data with less information on it. And uh, in that sense, it's always uh, the point uh, that you really need to see um, uh, how you build your information uh, architecture here, what kind of data you want to provide, uh, also what you want to get out uh, at the end of the day, as I said, uh, what data needs hard facts, uh, what data uh, you need to get in the knowledge graph. And then, of course, many data are already structured uh, data. And it's, of course, you don't want to lose uh, the information of the structured data or uh, uh, interlinking of the data. Uh, so this was definitely for us, uh, I think, uh, uh, experience when we learn with customers how uh, uh, to set up uh, uh, first uh, applications. So to see uh, what is the quality of unstructured data that they have, website, PDFs, and so on. Mm -hmm. And also how to feed this unstructured data in, how to prepare this unstructured data at the end uh, for good applications and how you can scale this in a quite low code, no code way uh, that you can access and build your applications on top of it. And uh, I think it's also a lot of learning and uh, interesting stuff uh, and it's i think just the beginning of what we can build of course in future here i think yeah i think we're all everybody everybody in this call and probably everybody watching this is still in the learning phase when we've made a lot of progress but lauren i want to go back to you and, and play off of something that alex brought up is talking about marketing data so when you look at all the data being captured on that side can you give an example of a client that you might have worked with where large language models are being used to enhance either customer experience or customer personalization, or basically making the success of marketing to help drive engagement. Sure, I definitely will. I just wanna actually pick up on something that Alex has said. 
um, before I answer the, the question, Doug. So I do think that it is, um, everyone's certainly in an ongoing learning journey. I also think important considerations that could be added to that are, you know, a lot of organisations, it's become more of a discussion between like not only a technical component of the organization but also business um, leaders so you've got business and technical involved in the decision around generative ai strategies we can see as well so recently portal 26 they did an extensive survey with c-suite executives to find out how far they were in experimentation in the phases they were in an experimentation with generative ai and they were quite um, interesting statistics and information that came out. And one of the more interesting components was that there was a lot of concern around reputational risk because a lot of employees who were maybe not as AI literate as we would like them to be at this stage were also unaware of the consequences of maybe uploading certain documents, certain data sets. So, you know, I think that there's still a huge opportunity um, for AI education around the consequences of data ingestion in LLMs, depending on the LLM that's offered, and obviously how that can impact um, an organisation. I think as well, we're still sort of in the fear, but slowly moving out of the fear, the more we become educated um, as an ecosystem in a market. Um, but I do think that there's still those, those huge considerations of reputational risk, um, as well as, as the fear that's driving it. Um, maybe to answer your next question then, so how you know, can they enhance customer experience and personalization? Um, so I think that obviously personalization has been around for a long time, but it's suddenly become associated with uh, large language models. And we've seen obviously that personalization exists with a lot of user behavior profile, and we've got deep um, learning recommender systems. Um, in that sense, I think that a lot of our expectations as well around personalization have been heightened by the technology um, and everything that has been on offer um, in the past few years. I think that we can see as well that, again, in a lot of recent surveys, especially with the popularity of LLMs being used in customer service, that, you know, the, the buyers, they want a good customer service experience. And... Customer service can sometimes be quite expensive, especially goods customer service for an organization. Um, and we see that I think that one opportunity, especially with customer service, is really to be able to minimize the costs and enhance customer service with, with AI. Um, we're looking at maybe, you know, the standardization of customer experiences and customer journeys, because we can, with the LLM, actually start to offer a more standardized customer experience because we can take a data-driven approach quite quite cheaply actually you know with the flexibility of large language mo models and um, the personas that we can create back end um, based on maybe top performing human agents we can really try to ensure that you know there is this molding and standardized impactful omni-channel customer journey um, so I really think that this is a, a good opportunity for AI and customer service. Um, we've recently been working, uh, you asked me for, for one example, so we've recently been working in service management quite a lot. Um, so similar sort of use cases that Alex mentioned before, um, the opportunity to really ensure that there is the enhancement of information retrieval um, on unstructured data sources. So if we're looking at websites, we're looking at fact sheets, we're maybe looking at internal documentation that might be necessary for a customer um, whilst ensuring possibly that there are access control limitations on, on the necessary documentation. Um, but we have been working on those on both websites and uh, company data. So try to alleviate um, customer service agents and providing maximum opportunity to be able to create knowledge-based generation um, and also advanced conversational um, through natural language interaction and conversion. If, if you can improve the consistency of engagement across uh, any kind of touch point for a customer, you'll make me happy as a user for one thing. <laughs> I'll make, you'll make a lot of people happy, but I completely agree. And I go, you, you mentioned omni-channel. I think just that ability using AI, using conversational AI to 
make it easier for a user to engage and get the, a consistent touch point across all the channels they go through, web, et cetera. Uh, very powerful. Uh, before I go to the next question, Vasil, anything you wanted to add there around personalization or customer experience and large language models? Absolutely. Uh, so, so, so our actually, it may be it may surprise you, but before to really give any of these technologies to our client clients, we had to test them on our own, and we actually these did these experiments. Actually, my first experience with this type of large language model was I had to fill a table of 600 software libraries of their license and their description for whatever reason. Actually, uh, I was amazed that I did this job in five minutes and all the descriptions were looking okay. They were not perfect, but they uh, looked fine. And all the licenses were filled. Then I had the bad work to check one of these libraries to make sure that they are correct. And I found out that 60% of the licenses were completely wrong. So on, on the type of task to generate the text, it was really quite good result. But when you had to go precise data, it was just completely on the target. Uh, so, uh, and I, I, the other, I think tomorrow or the day after we have a onto text knowledge graph project, actually, this is the uh, internal marketing activity where we are using AOMs and there will be special code there. Uh, but in general, about this per personalization and experience, I would say that our experience with the AOMs is that putting these things in production is very, very challenging. And if you really, and we have this experience with machine learning models where we know that putting a machine learning model in, produ in production is very difficult, actually. There are some estimates that say that one of every 10 models will fail. If we say for LLMs, I believe this mo number will be even lower, actually. Maybe one of 100, pro 100 projects will ever go to production. And still, uh, I, I want to still that the LLM is not everything around this type of technology and the underlying transformer technology and the way how it, you can scale the deep learning because this is the major leap in the technology there has can really improve a lot of other tasks like this type of recommendation and user experience uh so and at least on our side on aoms i don't see that per se there are many really heavy critical production grade systems uh we which we see but still on the underlying technology we see we see some quite good interesting projects for a much more limited thing like generating uh re generic relation extraction or other much more isolated tasks cool thank you um so we've 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 talked about and, and alex has mentioned the thing about unstructured data well actually all three of you have talked about the importance of unstructured data and I'm sure you've all seen the same statistics I've seen, 80 to 85% of data or information in a company is generally unstructured and not always being used as well. So Alex, I'm going to flip it back to you because I know you've got a lot of interest in this. Is What roles do you think or should LLMs play in the whole process of supporting knowledge graphs to get, I guess, to get the insights from unstructured data? How do we make the most use of that using this great AI technology? Yeah, I think it's, um, we use it actually uh, on both sides. We, uh, we use it, uh, so maybe first examples, how we use uh, unstructured data uh, or uh, create uh, uh, structured data uh, out of unstructured data. And this really makes it now quite easy with the large language model. So I think it was in common days and also Vasil touched it uh, already quite. So getting really information out of unstructured data uh, provide it, uh, link it to an ontology, link the data then in the proper way. Uh, this was really a heavy task and we recently did it for a customer. It was a, uh, the example is maybe uh, a, a simple, but uh, in former days it was a quite heavy technical uh, uh, challenge. Uh, this was just, we had event data, the event data are structured, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, there was an, an uh, each event uh, data set had a, a textual description. And in the textual description, it was actually quite useful information because it was in maybe uh, who is the band uh, that is uh, playing there, 
uh, what type of music uh, they are playing. Uh, uh, then sometimes it was information about the ticket price, but also information about how you can get in uh, the performance hall. Uh, so when you uh, when does entrance start? And uh, this was in former days. So when you ask um, a question, uh, it was for us in the, in the conversation and in the chatbot uh, quite difficult uh, to extract this information uh, that we can uh, run uh, proper dialogues exactly on uh, this important data because so we couldn't actually we had event data uh, but uh, just simple question do you can recommend me um, uh, a chess uh, uh, event uh, in that town was not so easy because if we didn't extract this data uh, we had maybe the entity uh, of the location uh, but we didn't have the, uh, the detailed data uh, of the uh, uh, music and all related information and this is now something really uh, when you have the, your mod uh, when you have your ontology and your domain model you easily uh, can uh, with a couple of uh, uh, prompting uh, types really uh, extract uh, those data map it actually uh, to your uh, uh, structured data and do your models and integrate it in the knowledge graph and this is really great uh, so this gives shows uh, just how powerful um, uh, now the tools are that we have that you really can uh, quite easily uh, uh, manage your data so that means it's not that you say okay let's as i said in the beginning let's put everything in one pot and the large language model will do it uh, but you really can now decide how you want to manage your data, where you want to get facts out of it, uh, because you want to get uh, queries on those facts uh, exactly as I described, because uh, uh, and uh, this uh, gives you really uh, a quite good combination in uh, uh, managing structured data, unstructured data, uh, but also, of course, then the integration uh, with services uh, where you maybe want to integrate real time uh, uh, data. And uh, and therefore, it's uh, something where we really spend a lot of resources and time. And some uh, the customers didn't understand. It was always then you put, didn't put the price maybe at that high up because it was, as I said, an easy task uh, with a lot of effort. And now it's done in a couple of uh, hours mm -hmm. and you uh, get really great data out of it. And this brings, in my opinion, a complete new dynamics into the space because you suddenly can do things. You get better data, you get better information. You can see uh, what type of applications uh, you're building. And also uh, you see uh, the, the combination when you, for example, as I also mentioned, the service integration, uh, when you look in uh, ChatGPT, uh, 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 the, the plugins, uh, you have a dialogue that is proper and then the service integration starts and there we have a, a broken technology at the moment because then suddenly a keyword based search uh, uh, starts uh, uh, maybe uh, into Expedia to find your right hotel that isn't mm -hmm. uh, working. And now I think if every uh, company starts now really uh, to improve the quality of the data, uh, we will get at the end of the day, I think really great user experiences out. And in my presentations, I always used, and I've also the earplugs in, and uh, there are a couple of movies like her or also Ex Mahina, where you have really this uh, uh, interaction with the machines. And this is, I, I think, where we will get there finally by exactly uh, solving uh, this interaction uh, uh, between structured and unstructured data uh, and uh, giving actual liability uh, to the data and information that we are consuming. And I think one of the things that, on a, that you were talking about was you know, getting, extracting all the data from the, un, the, un, the data and the information from that. To me, one of the most fascinating things about unstructured data is, again, touching on what I asked Lauren about, is how much information I think that we may miss, we organizations may be missing out on, whether it's log files. I mean, log files are kind of an unrecognized area where you can actually get a lot of information from. You start to connect those using graph technology but it's not always being thought about it because it's unstructured data. So I, mean, I think we, you know, obviously we've got a lot of passion for unstructured data being what we do, but the ability to connect all those things and then mine that and use that is, is pretty phenomenal. Uh, before I go to the wrap up, I, I see there is a, there is a question in the Q and A section. I'm going to take that one real quick. And again, I encourage the audience, if you have questions or thoughts you want to share, please put them into the chat window. So uh, the question was speaking of dialogue and engagement, what, your, what approach towards large language models can bring more people in the loop of what is now increasingly an automated operations? 
So uh, who wants to take that in? A, in a, let's give it a relatively short answer to make sure we save time for the last question. But who wants to take the first shot at that one? So I'll, I'll do the question again. Speaking of dialogue and engagement, what approach towards using large language models can, can basically bring more people into the loop of what we are facing of more increasingly automated operations? Actually, Lauren, I'm going to pick on you since you'd already kind of talked a bit about that from yeah, a sure. customer <laughs> support perspective. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, so I think that from what we've seen as well in the development of our own product when looking at Squirrel GPT, um, and we're focusing on the integration of the chat interface, um, either as an embedded um, sort of digital assistant on a website or as a chat interface in a workbench, then we're still looking heavily at the opportunity for validation in various components from humans at present. Um, so we're still looking for the validation of maybe sources that have been provided to ensure that the sources that are being surfaced are the correct sources. We're looking at the accuracy of the information that has been highlighted in the process of um, the information that has been retrieved. Um, we're also looking at the actual automation component, if there is an automated step post actual output from the digital assistant, that it can be verified at the moment to ensure that the system is providing the right information, it's providing the right automation, it's providing the right next step. Um, so everything at the moment is still very much about the complementary um, assistance of humans and uh, machines. Great. Another question came in, and, and the seal is my CTO. The, the, you know, I'm going to look to you for this one. And then, Alex, if you got some thoughts to add to it, please jump in. This is from Elliot. That's a bit of a long one, so bear with me. The majority of open source tools for integrating knowledge graphs with large language models focus on property graphs and text to cipher. So the question is, do the unique benefits of enterprise knowledge graphs using OWL, Sparkle, and Shackle, do they give different advantages over property graphs in LLM integration? So really like looking for what the compelling use cases is, use cases are of using RDF standards in LLM projects as opposed to property graphs and Cypher. Okay, uh, so, so the question, the way I understand it is, if you combine the LOMs, is there any still advantage of the RDF uh, data? Over uh, LPG. Yes, and I, I'll try to answer this a bit more in a generic way. Uh, typically, the, the LOMs and the way how you, obviously the success of the LOMs depends on the type of the training data you have. So if you're somehow able to create a high quality data, whatever is really the format, uh, I don't think I, I think that this is really the key success of using this type of a technology. And our our vision is always that um, the RDF standards and the data allows you really to make the data much more interoperable and lowers the barrier how you integrate data and how you can really connect the data with different type of systems. So I'll try to answer this in a in the same abstract way. Is I don't think the LPG is really by definition a model which makes the data integration easier. And if you have somehow high quality data, regardless of what it, its model, then you will be able to create it. Regarding the probably, I think the reference was to the research how you can generate cipher queries with large language models. Obviously, yes, this is something which also exists in the uh, Sparkle domain, uh, but where uh, the difference is basically, and I would say that it is probably slightly more challenging, is how to avoid the hallucinations if you have to generate the URIs and the meaning of the information. But on the other hand, if you see in my earlier presentation, you saw that it's very easy if there is no semantic also the LOMs to be misled about the meaning of the words and to know that uh, who is what is the height of the person to be of the character to mean the impact of so I, I don't think in any way semantics will go away. Uh, and yes, once again, for the LOMs, you need high quality data. W whatever you, is the way how you collect it, if you have it, then you can do good models. Great. And Alex, I think I've got a question that's great for you as well. So from Bilal, um, what methods or strategies can be effectively employed <clears throat> to enhance the interpretive 
interpretability, sorry, it's late in the day, interpretability of outputs generated by large language models to make the transparency and comprehension of the decision-making process behind creating the knowledge graphs based on their processed data. Let me go through it one more time because it's a lot of words. Basically, what they're looking for is how do we make the output more interpretable of large language models to make sure we're improving transparency and comprehension of good decision making based on a knowledge graph using that data. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, I think there are uh, uh, two different or uh, many uh, technologies mixed. On the one hand, it's of course uh, the stream uh, of the decision making. And I think uh, this is of course uh, quite important because each of us is always confronted uh, with many decisions. And in that sense, um, uh, uh, the, the 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 facts that we generate, I think, is is part of the decision making. And what we are doing, for example, is we are doing, uh, we are combining uh, for the decision making both references. So we are on the one hand says, okay, uh, these are the facts uh, that we get out of the knowledge graph. Uh, these have been interlinked here. And sometimes uh, when we have the unstructured data, we make also then the reference, for example, to external sources and say, okay, uh, you can uh, combine it. And in that sense, uh, you get, of course, uh, when you get an answer, it's up to you then to say, okay, do I believe or do I not believe? And what is the right reference uh, uh, that I can make here uh, uh, for the decision making? And this is, of course, a quite important part because uh, you always, and we always have different use cases. We are also in legal tech uh, in there. And it's uh, when you read, it's really for the user quite difficult. Is the information wrong or right? And this is, of course, uh, one part uh, where we exactly on the text that is provided on the answer in a dialogue by the large language model that we say, OK, in a nice style, including uh, cards. This is the, the fact uh, that we have from the knowledge graph. You can have a look on it if it's wrong or not and also provide of course the reference here uh, to make it easier and this is uh, of course uh, something um, uh, uh, you need to because uh, what i see uh, that this hallucination part is uh, still ongoing and therefore transparent information references uh, uh, with uh, uh, the different facts is uh, definitely quite important uh, also to use the systems at the end of the day for proper uh, decision making we're also uh, building for example in healthcare uh, uh, systems so in that sense uh, uh, of course uh, when we um, uh, combine the technology we need to have proper facts uh, because uh, maybe otherwise decisions are going in the wrong directions by doctors mm -hmm. And the, may I jump here because it's a very interesting question. I'm not sure who asked it, but indeed, yes, the large language models, they cannot reason and they don't have logic. If there is some sort of a logic, it's because they really read this from somewhere and they can reproduce this type of a content. Uh, still, I would say that there is an open research area. This is the neurosymbolic AI, where the people try to combine neural networks with AI and the logic order. Uh, like first order logic or any type of all. This is a, an active research area where all to text also participate, and but it will take really a much, much longer uh, uh, time to explain all the details there. But the answer is yes, we are yet to see some results in this research because many people are really willing to combine neural networks with uh, symbolic AI. And I think I'll jump in as well. So I do yeah, think that it's sort of tailing on to both what Azil and um, Alex have just said. I mean, that's where I really see the opportunity as well for um, knowledge graphs and LLMs to work in synergy and harmony. I think that there is an identifiable opportunity to really enhance the precision, to enhance context awareness, to enhance reference frames, to provide reference frames, especially in domains and you know, sectors that really need 100% precision and context. I mean, if we look at a semantic information retrieval stack, and then we couple that, you know, with graph insured search, and we pass that, you know, the understand the query over to the LLM, you know, you've got a sort of battle bridge that really will be able to provide what is necessary when you're looking at decision making as well because you're enhancing that accuracy, you're enhancing that context awareness. Um, and it's really something that, that can work very well um, as a synergy and, and marry and enhance those weaknesses that are offered by LLMs at the moment. 
Great. Yeah. Yeah. Great, great, great questions from the audience. So thank you. So we've only got a few minutes left. So I'm going to wrap this up. Uh, we'll have a, a speed question answer. And I'll cue this up. By, I was at a, a big data London not too long ago. One of the questions that was asked in an interview is, what do I see as the future of data management? And I very quickly said, graph technology is going to rule. So let's flip that back over to you guys and say, so, you know, in, in as close as you can to 90 seconds, maybe two minutes, uh, can you tell me how you think large language models and knowledge graphs will shape the future of data-driven business strategies? Uh, let's start with you, Alex. Yeah, I think uh, first, uh, from technology point of view, these are two technologies uh, that are complementary and they really enhance each other in a great way uh, that you uh, can build uh, great systems out of it. So you have on the one hand the symbolic AI, uh, what we said, uh, where you create all the structured data or you create as unstructured data, uh, those structured data, you interlink the data, you have the full semantics, you get effects and facts are quite often very important. And on the other hand, of course, we have this easygoing uh, uh, large language models uh, where you get out of the statistical uh, uh, models uh, information, you can uh, build a uh, great text, you can uh, process images, you can do 3D rendering, uh, whatever actually uh, you need here. And uh, what uh, is I see in the future is here is on the one hand, I think, uh, the part how we will manage data, how we will interlink the data. And here again, both technologies uh, will actually um, uh, complement each other in a, in a quite great way because you you have the mess, uh, as we said, 80% on the one hand. On the other hand, you want to get uh, great structured data. And the, sometimes you say, okay, leave the mess there because I don't need to structure it. And at the end of the day, it's uh, what uh, will make it uh, happen is this how we interact. And here, my future is, uh, as I said, uh, out of this uh, 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 future movies, uh, uh, science fiction movies, where you say, okay, we will interact in an easy way going, uh, uh, I have a question, I ask the question, it's a context, uh, 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 I can uh, do my work here, uh, 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 do robot process automation, I, uh, I need to repair something, I don't need to search for a YouTube video, uh, but I can say, hey, guy, this is my description, what I need to do, uh, I have, uh, do you have a problem for me, whatever use it is, is there, and I think this will uh, change a lot in our private life, uh, but also, of course, in our business life, uh, uh, how we fulfill our work and it's of course automation at the end of the day mm -hmm. uh, which also is an economic factor because the machine doesn't care uh, if it gets in the customer service a thousand requests in the minute or uh, only one minute uh, uh, one request maybe you have a difference in the software license uh, but it's not a difference that you need uh, uh, in people and resources uh, when you need to process this and this will be also an economic impact uh, uh, where i think a lot of changes is going on and i'm looking forward also to see how the complete software applications uh, will change in future uh, because we are interacting uh, with our data information in a complete different way and uh, this will be quite interesting interesting is a good a good word for it Vasil, you got uh, three minutes how about that okay so obviously aoms change a lot the way how to generate information uh and the cost really went down but still the we we still follow the same principle, data science principle that if you put crap in, it will get crap out at the end. So I don't think on the knowledge graph and how the people trust the information, there will be any su substantial change in, in the large language models. Imagine that somebody is telling, oh, we invested your retirement savings in the wrong company because the IOM was thinking that this is works the same company. It will never happen. But still, the IOMs will change a lot the knowledge graphs, because they already reshape how the people access information. Even if you see some companies like Google and their UX team that they had really the best type of search interfaces, now they're really changing their approach, how the people interact with the information. So I'm pretty sure that the idea how you have really, you speak with a machine in natural language will become the norm for the next generation, user interfaces and everything we are building. So all these data-driven businesses, we expect that the knowledge graph will speak the language of the humans. And this will change how the people really interact with the information. 
I like it. Lauren, what's the what's the future? <laughs> yeah, what's the future? I wish I knew. And then uh, I'm sure that I would say it'd be much more profitable if I were be able to foresee that. Um, but I do. Um, there's many components that have been picked up both by um, by all of us uh, that are represented here in the panel today. I think that the future is still uh, relatively unclear um, to some extent. I mean, I do think that there's heavier sort of realisation and understanding, even more so in the sense that rubbish data in equals rubbish data out. I mean, I think that there's a lot of narratives at the moment in the ecosystem that are talking about the importance of data management. Um, so that will become ever more important when people start to experiment further with LLMs. I think that it goes back to a couple of points. So again, my point about the opportunity to really enhance precision, contact awareness and reference frames. I also think that um, one important statement that Jan Le Kuhn made at the very start when the whole revolution happened or the AI age was kicked off, and that's LLMs are not made for search. And they're certainly not made for accurate search. So I think that in terms of anyone that's looking for an enhancement in data-driven business processes, it's looking at technologies and Knowledge Graph offers this sort of supplementation to ensure that you have that accuracy that you want to rely on um, when you're looking at data and data analytics. Um, so I certainly see, um, as mentioned by Alex and Vasily, a sort of hybrid model fusion um, more about sort of the development of algorithms that use both textual information, um, but also graph-based insights for decision-making and information retrieval. Um, that's what I'd like to see anyways. <laughs> I like it. I'll be very curious to see where, if we have this same panel a year from now, uh, what kind of conversations we'll be having. So as we wrap up, I want to uh, to thank Lauren, to thank Alex, to thank Vasile. Uh, thank the audience for the questions and to remind everybody that the recordings, all the entire day's recordings and tomorrow and the next day, they'll be available for re-watching and enjoying afterwards. So uh, if you miss anything today, there, there's a lot more opportunities for us to continue to learn. Um, with that, again, Doug Kimball, uh, appreciate your time and your interest in this. And thank you for the panelists for all your work. Have a great day. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.